Buckle up and hold on. At our church, we love God. Make no mistake about that. At our church, we believe in God's radical, unconditional, and unwavering love for us. At our church, we believe that Jesus is God. We also affirm that you may or may not believe that Jesus is God. And we're not asking you to change your belief system before you attend our church. We're simply inviting you on a journey toward Jesus. For years, churches have placed a high priority on Jesus as the get out of hell free card. At our church, we place the highest priority on Jesus as a live life to the fullest invitation. At our church, we believe every person has a dream deep inside their hearts and that God put that dream there, not for our glory, but for His. At our church, we're not concerned with where you've been, but where you're going. At our church, we believe that the Bible is God's Word. It is real. It is living. It is active. We believe that people who don't go to church anywhere are not the enemy. They are real people who need the perfect love that only God can give. And we believe that God gives this love through, of all people, us. At our church, we do not and we will not display a holier-than-thou attitude toward anyone. We are all broken people, but He is putting us back together. And finally, and most importantly, at our church, we believe that Jesus really lived, that He really died on the cross, and that He really rose again on the third day. And we cannot and we will not candy coat or water down that message, ever. Today, you've chosen to sit yourself in the middle of a very safe place to hear a potentially dangerous message. Welcome to our church. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Ian, we're skipping the video. <laughs> I am a walking technical difficulty tonight. I am so sorry. That's right. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the first Friday night of the year. I'm so excited for this. I'm so excited to see all you bright, happy people. This is wonderful. A couple of a quick announcements before we get started. Uh, tomorrow, finally, the yard sale is here. You guys seem so excited about the yard sale. I'm excited to get all this stuff out of here. Jen's got a motorcycle class tomorrow, so please pray for Jen. This ought to be interesting for her. <laughs> Brad's next week, right? Yeah, Brad's is next week. So yard sale, we are going to be here between 5 and 6 a.m. Uh, we are going to set up a lot of stuff tonight. Uh, that way we can, we're going to set up in here. We'll, see, we'll get tables. We're going to pull all of this stuff out, put it up here. We're going to get tables set up in here, get the tables loaded up. Uh, and then that way, if it's nice, we can just move stuff outside if we need to. But we're going to be here really early, so please come and help us really early. We've got the Riders to End the War Within. Their, biker, their blessing of the bikers is coming right up. Uh, this is June 10th. Uh, we're going to be leaving here out of Augusta. We're going to all meet up at 8 o'clock at the Irving on Bangor Street in Augusta. Uh, Riverside Drive, I guess it is technically. Uh, we're going to meet up there at 8, uh, kickstands up at 8.30. Uh, this is not something that you have to ride a motorcycle to, so if you guys want to drive up and follow us up, that would be really cool. Uh, we're going to go up as a group, and we're going to bless these people. We're going to go pray over a whole bunch of people and offer uh, spiritual support for anybody that might need it. We've got our benefit dinner for the Gregors coming right up the end of the month, June 24th from 3 to 5 right here. Jen's got a sign-up sheet. Uh, we've got a really cool auction that's going to happen. We've got all kinds of really neat things that are coming in. Uh, so please come and, you know, please be here for that as well. Uh, that's what I got for tonight. So again, if you guys support this ministry uh, and you, you like the stuff that we do, please consider uh, supporting us uh, financially. Uh, we are growing uh, and we've got some really great opportunities that I'm not quite ready to share with you guys yet. I shared them with our leadership team last night. Uh, but we've got some really, really cool things coming up. Uh, and all of these things, you know, obviously, you know, they, they, they take a little bit of financing. You know, we've got some repairs that we've still got to do as well. Uh, last thing, before we get started, 
Kevin Kimball, I'm going to have you come right on up. Get off your phone, sir. <laughs> Bust it. <laughs> you can bring your dog. <laughs> I finished sewing for you, sir. Oh, look at that. <laughs> I would like to welcome our newest probationary member of our church. Everybody say, welcome, Kevin. <laughs> They'll be here. I'm, I'm completely convinced they'll be here. All right. Let's stand and have our worship team come on up. Let's worship God.
Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. The Lord your God is among you. He is mighty to save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. When silence falls, I hear you call. soul with quiet joy and I'm wide awake in the middle of the night I look up to the sky I can hear you singing over me in the fire on the fly I know that I am loved I can hear you singing Shining all else fades, never ending, 
50 more of her. <laughs> we do have a dog tonight. Well, that was awesome. Thank you, guys. All right. Well, at this time, let us uh, turn loose the children out to Chopper Church. I hope you guys have a great time, Miss Kara. I hope you have an awesome time. So you guys will have to forgive me tonight. I'm feeling a little under the weather. No pun intended. <laughs> feeling a little uh, less than spectacular. I think I have what Georgia had last week. So bear with me. It's a good thing I have a microphone because you can't really talk all that loud. That's not true. <laughs> I can't back that up. Jesus, please help me. Well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, welcome back to week three of our sermon series entitled, Jesus Said What? I think I got a slide for that. I do, right there. We're on a mission to put what Jesus said, Jesus' words, those red letter things that we have here in our Bibles into practice. And I'm excited for this series. I don't know about you guys, but this, this has lit me up so far. We're looking at five main principles uh, that Jesus calls and commands and asks his followers to put into practice. Um, let's take a quick look at those five principles real quick. Anybody remember what those five targets were real quick? Anybody? Oh, hang on. Don is flipping through pages. It's being, forgiving, serving, giving, and going. I might even have a slide for that, do I? No, I don't. I don't have a slide for that this week, guys. Sorry. So last week, we spent uh, the week talking about being with Jesus. Uh, this week... We are going to spend a week on forgiveness. This is a tough one. And today, you'll notice I got a couch up here today, which is very unlike church for us. Uh, but this is, this is kind of an analogy. So as we talk about forgiveness, uh, I want to illustrate forgiveness today. We're going to go from the couch to the temple courts, to the courtroom today. So I've got a couch up here on stage, um, and this couch looks pretty nice. I mean, there's no stains, right? Well, there's a little stain. Don't, don't look there. But there's no stains. There's no rips. Um, the outside looks pretty good, right? So far, so good. The outside looks pretty good. And typically, we have couches at our house uh, they're usually very nice. We invite our friends over to come and sit on them sometimes. 
Couches are nice in most people's houses except for mine because I have a little brown dog that likes to eat mine. I've gone through four. She is adorable, but she's horrible when it comes to eating furniture. She eats couches, and she's awful. Anyways, they look good on the outside. And we sit on these couches a lot. I know I sit on mine a lot when I've got some free time. But have you ever taken a minute and flipped over your couch cushions? Yeah. (laughs) There's always something cool under there, right? It's like a a scavenger hunt. But you know, you're always surprised on what's underneath those cushions. And you know, most people don't do that very often because you got to start preparing yourself physically and emotionally and sometimes spiritually for what you might find under those couch cushions. You know, you could find crumbs or sometimes you find some change. Uh, who knows, you could, this day and age, you could probably find some coronavirus under, my, under a couch cushion. But you never know what you're sitting on. You don't realize you're sitting on top of all of this crud and all of this junk. You have no idea. So as, as we kind of start digging around in our couch, you know, we start looking at things like, I don't know, we find a ball or, you know, a business girl. Oh, Worship Radio Network, we should call her. Put her over here. Uh, You know, kickstand puck, those are necessary. Uh, Oh, that's where my beard comb went. Put that in my pocket. I should probably wash that off first before I use it. Oh, my phone. I've been looking for this. No wonder I couldn't find it. It was stuffed in the couch. You know, and this next one, this next one is a little, I can't imagine why this would be in here, but, you know, this Harley Davidson t-shirt, you know, the greatest, in my opinion, it's a great motorcycle. We're just going to leave this here for subliminal messages for the rest of the, the rest of the night. We'll leave that right there. Anyways. Underneath our couch cushions, we find all kinds of stuff. What's crazy, though, is you'd never know all of that stuff was under your couch cushions unless you go looking for it. And a lot of us live lives represented by that couch. You know, we we, we try to make ourselves look good. You know, we dress up nice or, you know, I, I do my hair. Well, this way anyway. I do my hair. Make ourselves look pretty on the outside. You know, we're, we're very well put together. There, there's no stains on the outside most, for most of us. You know, we, we come to church and we act like politicians. You know, we hug people and we kiss hands and shake babies. That's not how that goes. Wait a minute, how, do, how does that go again? We kiss babies and shake hands. That's how that goes. But you know, we look good on Facebook and Instagram and you know, LinkedIn and all those other social media things and you know our family looks perfect and we look happy and we're doing awesome and everything is a highlight reel from the beginning until the end even the stuff that's in the back according to our facebook profile right but the reality is the reality is is that we're very much like this couch if you dig down deep you're gonna find something Every one of us will find something that might be a little messy. Agreed? And a lot of us, a lot of us take that stuff and we push it down deep. Because what do we do? if, If we just push it down, we can ignore it, right? We just push that stuff down deeper into the couch. That way nobody else sees it either. Oh, what is that? Ew. If we push it down deep, nobody else is ever gonna see it either. And we learn how to live. We, we build up these mechanisms and these coping mechanisms on how we can live with our junk and our garbage underneath us. We just stuff it down. It's like feelings. We just stuff them down. And it can be really easy to form a community around that type of picture. Churches form around that type of picture. 
And if I'm going to be completely transparent with you, we can be like that too. Where everything looks great standing up here, but just underneath the surface, maybe there's a bunch of stuff that, that we're just not that proud of. You know, we're all human. We all have stuff. And what happens is sometimes, sometimes people whose lives don't look so great, you know, those couches that might look a little dirty or might have a stain or maybe their dog ate one of the corners off of it. Maybe one of those couches comes in. And because we spend so much time making sure our couches look good, they come in and they sit and they think they're the only ones that might be a little messed up, that might be a little torn up, and might be a little, you know, messy on the inside. And I'm here to tell you tonight that they're not the only ones. You guys are not the only ones. You're not. That kind of a community is built on what is fake and what is plastic and those non-authentic things and it's not a real community at all. Real community uh, in the pathway to freedom is understanding that this is who we are. This is who we are. The good, the bad, and the ugly, this is who we are. Real freedom comes from knowing that we are hot messes first. And when you can accept that, there is a whole lot of freedom in Jesus in that. I'm just letting you guys know that tonight. But that attitude, that attitude is, it's not a given these days. You know, some people think that I'm fine, I'm fine, everything's fine, it's fine, Jen, it's fine, I'm fine. I'm just, I'm fine. I'm comfortable where I am, I like the stuff that I'm in. Nobody else sees my mess, so it can't possibly be affecting people that bad. There's a music stand there. I've been to so many funerals, and I've heard so many people say that it's okay. This was a good person. You know, she was a good person. They're in a better place now because they were a good person. And geez, I don't know where that warped doctrine came from, but I know what my Bible says. I know what this says in Romans 3 and 10. It says that there's no one that's righteous, not even one. Not even one. And let's face it, I think when Paul was talking about not even one, he was talking about us too wasn't just then, it was now, us too. It's important that each of you know that you're sinners. It's important that each of you know that you're guilty for the sin that you have in your life. I know that seems a little bit harsh, but I promise there's a point to that. You know, deep inside each person here in this room tonight you might be surprised that there is a great deal of hurt, including this guy. Everybody here has been hurt about something. We all carry around some kind of hurt, whether it's physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever. We all carry around some kind of hurt. Maybe it's a hurt that your friends don't even realize that you have. Maybe it's a hurt that you've buried down so deep that even your spouse doesn't know you have it. Many of us, many of us are not free because we're held captive by our past. I want you guys to hear that tonight. Many of us are captive by our past. It's like an old couch that we can't get rid of. I love the couch analogies tonight. But it is like an old couch. You guys ever have that couch from when you were in college? It's a little grody, but it was super comfortable and you hated to get rid of it. You just kept putting a blanket over it to make it look like it looked better. You all know what I'm saying. Don't judge me. I had that couch. I still have that kind of I have that couch. 
But we can't get rid of it. And so we keep living that mess in our lives over and over and over because it's comfortable for us. That mess we live in is comfortable. But church, if we can't let go of our past, we are never going to be able to grab hold of our future. Now listen. All right, listen. If you're a Jesus follower, if you call yourself a Christian, I want you guys to listen to what I'm about to say. Jesus did not die on a cross, suffer a brutal death, rise from that, so you could live the rest of your life as a slave. Do you guys understand this tonight? God sent His Son to die on a cross for you and I so we could know freedom. So we could be free from our pasts and we could be free in our present and understand that we have freedom in our futures. Some of you Some of you, God is telling you it's time to flip over your couch cushions and start looking for the mess. Some people here tonight might get those cushions flipped over while they're here, and I'll help you clean it up, I promise. I'll do what I can for you. But He's going to bring us through that. He's going to bring us through the trials of having to sit and look and go, oh, that's mine? I don't remember that thing. It's yours. Hang on to it. Claim it. Own it. Because when you own it, you can get rid of it. And the reason why I mention this stuff tonight is because when you mention the words righteous and just... There's freedom that comes with that. But can we truly live a free life if we're living with a bunch of crud underneath our couch cushions? God wants to take away your crap and He wants to take away your crud. He wants to get rid of the junk. That's why we're having a yard sale tomorrow. He wants to take away your past. And He wants to remove that for you today. There's a really cool story about God's grace. And a lot of people struggle to talk about what God is like. And they use a lot of different words. A lot of times, the longer people have been in their faith, they use bigger words to describe God. And most times they use words that most non-believers don't understand when they talk about God. Like, He's the Trinity. He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, He's co-equal and co-eternal. And so it's really hard for people that don't live for Jesus to truly understand what He's like and get a picture of Him. And it's really hard when you're using those big words to describe God for people to be able to picture what He would do in a particular situation for them. And when we talk about the courtroom later tonight, uh, it's hard to know what God is going to be like in that setting. But what's great is that God gives us clear pictures to help us know who He is. And the clearest picture you can ever have of who God is is Jesus Christ. Jesus was God, robed in flesh. He sent Jesus into this world to reveal to us what God is like, what His nature is what his character is like, how he would act, how he responds to certain situations and certain stupid stuff that we do. He 
He sent Jesus to help us get through those messes that we find under our cushions. And one of the most amazing stories in the Bible about Jesus is in John chapter 8. It's one of my favorite stories because this is a story and what we're going to see in this story that, that Jesus is going to come to a woman's defense. And so as we start talking about this, we're going to move from the couch. Yeah, I stole your couch. We're going to move from the couch and we're going to move now into the temple courts. Okay? It's not an actual courtroom, but it's the temple courts. And I want you guys to picture this because they bring this accused woman before Jesus. And Jesus is going to act as her defense attorney and the judge all at the same time in this story. And what's unique about this story is among many of the other, among many others in the Word of God, is right above and right below this passage is going to be bold, ita- bold or italics, depending on what you have. So, in some of the earliest, it'll say some, in some of the earliest manuscripts that this passage doesn't exist. That this story wasn't in some of the original manuscripts. And that's true. This story has not been in every one of the biblical manuscripts. Uh, some people think it, think it's because it's such controversial in nature. That what Jesus does in this story is so scandalous that they couldn't have possibly have written it down. Why would they ever do that? So I want you guys to check this out. This is, we're, we're in John chapter 8 tonight. And it's, it starts out like this. But Jesus went to, the Mount of, to, went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery and they made her stand before the group. Now at this point, you guys might be asking, where's the dude? It's a valid question, right? They bring the woman... Where's the dude? Where's the dude? If she's committing an adulterous act, you can't really commit adultery with one person. Takes at least two. Where's the guy? They just brought the woman. And they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? So far, they're right. So far, they're right. Besides not bringing the guy, of course. Because the law says in Deuteronomy 22.22, if a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge the evil from Israel. They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis of accusing him. This was an elaborate plan, okay? This was an elaborate plan that they'd hatched for a long time. You can't tell me that this woman just happened to get caught in adultery, like they were hanging out by, by the side of her house and they caught her. This was an elaborate plan. Probably the reason that the man wasn't brought in is because he was probably in on it. I can't biblically back that up. It's just a feeling. Just a feeling. And this woman, this woman is a means to an end to trap Jesus. And that's exactly what the Pharisees are doing. They're trapping Jesus. They're bringing this woman to him to catch him in a very difficult situation. They want to catch him in a contradiction. They want to catch him in front of all those disciples where they can go, ha, I told you he was wrong. So if he answers yes, you should stone this woman. Then it seems that he's going against everything that he's been doing and teaching so far. And so that wouldn't feel right. 
And if he says, no, don't stone her, then that would seem like he's relaxing on his, his public morals and relaxing on the law. And, you know, the law is important and you want to follow the law and you make sure you follow all the rules, guys, and make sure that you're, best, you're the best rule follower that you can be because the rules are what matter, right? Rules. So they bring this question that is meant to trap him. These cunning hypocrites. But Jesus, they're far overmatched when it comes to Jesus. But Jesus bent down and started writing on the ground with his finger. Picture this. Okay, picture this. They've hatched this plan, okay? This huge elaborate plan. They've got this poor woman, mostly naked, hanging out in front of the whole temple court, accusing her. And at that moment, Jesus stoops down and he starts to write in the dirt. He starts doodling on the ground. And you can imagine how frustrating that was probably to the Pharisees. They thought they had him dead to rights either way. And at this point, he's just ignoring them. That might seem a little frustrating and disrespectful. I can't imagine this, this plan that they had, that they were working on for weeks, maybe months. They're at the big aha moment of their plan. They've got Jesus cornered. And he starts doodling in the sand. When they kept on questioning him, they weren't happy with the response of him ignoring them. Writing in the sand. They weren't happy with that. So they keep at him. They keep probing at him. He straightened up and he said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. And you know, it's fascinating the things that the word of God includes. But to me, what's fascinating is some of the things that the word of God doesn't include. One of the biggest questions ever Debated by biblical scholars forever. Is what did Jesus write on the ground that day? What did he write? And there's a lot of theories out there. You know, here are some of the most intriguing ones that I found. I found three really good ones. He was doodling. Uh, he's just drawing stick figures, you know, or, or something like that. Maybe because he, he feels that this doesn't merit his time, so he just grabs a piece of ground and he starts drawing pictures. Maybe he was just challenging them to do a game of tic-tac-toe. That could have been possible. Number two, maybe Jesus was writing down a Bible verse for them. Who knows what verse it could have been, but maybe he was writing down a Bible verse. You know, he knew a lot of them, probably all of them. Maybe Jesus was writing a Bible verse. Or number three, to me, this was the most interesting one because it kind of makes the most sense to me. Uh, but again, who knows? Because it doesn't say. We can speculate. And there are some, some scholars that suggest that Jesus started writing down the names of the people that were there. And next to their names, he started writing down the sins of their life. Those men that were holding the stone, standing in that circle, waiting to kill that woman, got called out on their crap. Jesus found the stuff under their cushions. And out beside each one of their names, he wrote down their sins. And why do you think the older ones left first? Because they had more sins, folks. They were around longer. They had more dirt. 
There was more junk under their cushions. And you know, they wanted to talk about this woman's dirt and Jesus was like, I'm down in the dirt. You guys want to talk about dirt? That's fine. Let's talk about dirt. I know some things about you guys. Let's talk about that. You know, maybe he was like, all right, Henry, last Tuesday, you lusted after a married woman and it was his wife. So maybe you guys might want to walk away and talk about that for a little bit. And, you know, obviously those guys would have walked away and they were probably having a heated discussion at that point. And the older ones left first because they had the longest list. What I think is fascinating about this story is a lot of people think that we need to come to Jesus with our best. Then he'll come and he'll forgive us. You guys think how, that's how that works? What I love about this story is so far in this story, what do you guys notice about this woman? She hasn't said a thing. She sat there quiet. And, you know, in fact, if you can imagine, don't let your mind trail off with this thought, but 30 minutes ago, she was doing something with a married man that she shouldn't have been doing. We all know what that something was. I'm not going to mention it. But 30 minutes ago, she was sleeping with a married man. I guarantee the last thing in her mind was, I'm going to be dragged into court and be put in front of Jesus and have to explain myself. 30 minutes earlier, she was literally sleeping with somebody else's husband. She had no idea. And now she's dragged in front of Jesus. And I can guarantee she did not plan on that. She was not planning on her life changing that day. She was not planning on staring into the eyes of her loving Savior. And up until this point, she hasn't said anything. She hasn't made an elaborate confession. She hasn't made excuses. And here we have Jesus breaking into her life in a way that was completely unexpected. And some of you may be here tonight, some people that are watching online may be here tonight with us at a point in your life where maybe your wife is making you go to church or maybe she's making you sit down and watch this ridiculous guy on the internet. Uh, you know, maybe you get dragged, you know, one of your friends is like, hey, I think you should come to church with me and you just want to get them to shut up so you finally tell them, okay, I'll go. Maybe I'll just do that just so they'll stop bugging me. But we all know those people, right? And I want to tell you that Jesus is going to come. He's going to come into your life and he's going to flip over your cushions when you least expect it. And he's going to come to you and say, I've got something better for you. I've got something better than all the dirt that's under these cushions. The stuff that you've been holding on to for your life. The stuff that you're comfortable in. I've got something better for you. You just have to let that stuff go. Trust me. Come with me. Follow me. I've got something better. If you want it. That's the trick. If you want it. So Jesus straightens up and he asks, the, asks her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go and leave your life of sin behind. the only one that had the ability to throw a rock. Didn't. The only one that had the ability to condemn this woman dropped the stone. 
He says, woman, I didn't come to condemn you. I came to save you. I didn't come to declare you guilty. I came to set you free. And in fact, I mean, most of us know John 3.16. You quizzed us on this last week. (laughs) You know, for, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. But do you guys know the next verse? If anybody says John 3, 17, I'm going to punch you in the nose. <laughs> but John three seventeen says, For God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's not what that says, is it? That's what that says. Right there. That one. I told you I'm a walking technical difficulty tonight. Jesus came to justify each and every one of us, church. He came to reconcile our sin debt and to set us free. You should be excited about that. This woman's couch cushions got flipped over and all of her crud was bare. For all the world to see. Happened in front of everybody. And if that's what it takes, I'll take that mess. Every single time. Flip my cushions over, Lord. Flip them over. Don't listen to the lies that other people say about you. They're not your judge and jury. He is. Jesus is your judge and jury. He said, all of these people that were going to condemn you, they're gone now. Your jury's gone. Your accusers are gone. Thank you, Jesus. He's saying, it's just me and you. It's just me and you. Man, I love it when my naysayers are gone. Because I get a lot of them. I get a lot of them. I love it when my accuser is gone and it's just me and Jesus. And he says, I've been your defense attorney. And because no one else is around, nobody else is around, I'm going to be your judge too. And guess what? You're innocent. I'm saving you. You're free. Go and sin no more. When we go and we follow after Jesus, and when we live in this world for Jesus, the enemy's powerful. He fights. Because remember, he doesn't, He's not going to fight for what he's already got. So as you're getting fought, remember, you're getting fought because Jesus has got your back. And if he can get you to falter, then he gets to win. And we already know who wins. I read the rest of the book. But we have a very powerful accuser. He shouts accusations at you. And he's going to throw his rocks and his fiery darts. And if he doesn't hit you with those fiery darts, don't worry. He's got friends that pick them up and throw them at you. Just because they didn't go far enough. Maybe they might hit you. And he's going to remind you what you did. And he's going to remind you what you said. And he's going to remind you what you did again. And he keeps doing it. And he keeps doing it. And he keeps doing it. And he wears you down. He's going to tell you that you're you're used goods, you're washed up. God will never love a person like you and why would God ever use you? Nobody is going to love you. Any of this sound familiar to anybody? Does to me. One of the biggest problems we have in this world is we listen to lies. We listen to lies. And we listen to accusations of our enemy. 
instead of listening to the truth of the Gospel. We should be listening to the truth that Jesus came. He came to save us. He came to justify us. And He came to set us free. Jesus loves you. I can't say that any simpler. And every time the enemy fights you, and he tries to remind you that you're no good and you're worthless, and that you're used goods, and he can, tries to condemn you, just remember, just remember that Jesus was the one that dropped the rock. He's the one that said, you know what, Chris? You've done some really messed up things, but I forgive you. Don't believe the lies about how dirty you are and how worthless you are and how messed up you are. Just say to the devil, you know what, devil? I understand that I'm messed up and I'm screwed up and I've screwed up in my past, but God got down in the dirt for me. He got down in the dirt for me and He forgave my sins. He wiped my past clean. He didn't condemn me. Because he didn't come to condemn the world, he came to set it free. He came to set it free. You get to tell the devil that you're already loved. And then he needs to drop that stupid rock because it's not his job. You get to tell him that you have a Savior that's staring right in your eyes. And he's telling you to go sin no more. That's mercy. That's mercy. For every dirty person, for every unclean person, everybody that's got regrets, every lost person, every broken person, everyone that doesn't fit, I want you to know that God stoops down in the dirt. He gets as low as he can and he stoops down in the dirt and he raises us up. You are no longer a person that the devil can get down. Because he doesn't own you. So now... Surprised I still have a voice after that. (laughs) We've gone from the couch. We've gone to the temple court. Let's go to the courtroom. I'm going to tell you guys a story. Thankfully, I haven't had much experience in court, but I'm going to tell you guys a story. A few years ago, I may have been a different person than I am now. And... This is a story that involves court, but I didn't actually have to go to court for this. I had a rough week a couple of years ago. Uh, I was riding my motorcycle, and I think it was pretty late in the day, and because I was speeding through my neighborhood, and you know I wouldn't speed unless it was really late, right? Just saying. None of you seem to believe me. <laughs> Because most of you have ridden with me. (laughs) I would never speed unless I had a good excuse. Not once. I needed to get there on time. There's never a cop in my neighborhood. Never. Except for this day. Lo and behold, there's a cop in my neighborhood. And he pulls me over. And he says... Do you know why I pulled you over? And that's a dumb question. Because they want to see how guilty you are. They want to know how much you're going to give up. I don't know. So he pulls me over, and I thought maybe he'll let me go. Maybe he'll find out that I'm a pastor, and maybe he'll, he'll, he'll have some mercy on me, and he'll find some grace, and maybe he'll let me go. So he pulls me over, and he comes up to my bike, And he says, do you know why I pulled you over? And I said, yes, I was speeding. I'm sorry, officer, because I'm respectful. He says, you were doing 38 to 25. 
I'm sorry. So sorry. And he goes back to his, I know, right? <laughs> She's over here and says, is that all? Yeah, it's because he didn't catch me in earlier in the day. Anyway, <laughs> he's, so he goes back to his car. And he comes back, not with a warning, but with a ticket. And he says, I'm going to show you some grace. And I took it from 38 in a 25 to 35 in a 25. And I said, officer, I don't think you quite understand what grace is. You know, grace is this gift that you're given that you don't deserve. And it's a totally free gift. And did I mention it's undeserved? I didn't actually say that to him. It's what I want. So I said it in my head. You don't say that to a cop. I mean, you don't say that to a cop. So I went home and I was frustrated. I went to bed and I was frustrated and I got up in the morning and guess what? Frustrated. And I got on my bike and I went to work. And all of a sudden, boo, blue lights in my mirrors. Really? Cop car right behind me. Second time in 11 hours. This time the cop's not in a car. He's on a motorcycle back when Augusta had motorcycle helps. And I'm like, ah, my people. Maybe he wants to tell me my bike is cool. <laughs> yeah, probably not. Maybe, just maybe, he was coming up to me to tell me that they were going to revoke the ticket from last night. <laughs> yeah, that didn't happen either. I look in my mirror and lo and behold, it's the same guy. So I turn off my bike and he walks up to me and he says, ah, you again. <laughs> Good morning, officer. How are you doing today? That was pleasant. I had coffee at that point. He says, do you know why that I pulled you over? And I said, I have no idea why you pulled me over. What did I do this time? And he says, I got you running a stop sign back there. And I was like, <clears throat> And I thought, really? Oh, come on. But, oh, man. what? It, I mean, it, was it possible? I like the rolling stop, but it's a sort of a stop. But it's a, still a stop, kind of. My feet don't touch, but it's a stop-ish. And I said, man, I am so sorry about that. I was just kind of in a daze thinking about our interaction last night. I was still kind of in a mood. And I was really bummed and I'm sorry. And he said to me, out of curiosity, what is it that you do? And I said, ah, here's my chance. <laughs> he goes, I see you zipping around all over the place, and I see you breaking the law quite a bit. What is it that you do? And I said, I'm a pastor. <laughs> Just like you, I serve the city I'm like a superhero. He says, okay, well, what church do you, do you pastor at? And I was like, well, the first church of the Baptist Pentecostal something. Because I didn't want him to know that I was still training to be a pastor. I kind of threw that out there, hoping maybe I might get that grace. <laughs> truth be told, I wanted to tell him the truth, so I did. And I told him I was training to be a pastor, and I was running around doing all the things that I'm supposed to do and I'm just not very good at it yet and time management's not my best thing. So he says, stay right here. He goes back to his bike. Comes back very quickly. And I'm like, this can't be bad, right? Well, he still had all my stuff from last night. So it didn't take very long. He hands me a ticket. Two and ten hours. Since then, I haven't had any tickets. I'm allowed to still ride my motorcycle and I get to church okay. But he says to me, you know, you can take, you can either pay this fine or you can go to court and contest it. And I thought to myself, you know, last night he had me dead to rights. I'm not going to contest that one. But maybe I think I might have stopped at that stop sign. So I was talking to a friend of mine, my friend Frank, and I was talking to him and I said, 
hey, let me tell you this thing, and Frank just happens to be an attorney. And he says, let me see your tickets. I'll take care of them. And I was like, really? He says, let me see your tickets. I'll take care of them. I was like, is this one of those questions that like, we're not really having right now? <laughs> because he's like, yes. I said, okay, whatever. A few months go by, and I get a text message from Frank that my case is going to court. Don't worry about it. I got things covered. Okay. Goes to court. I get a text message from him. He's like, dude, deputy's totally not happy with you. Uh, they're, they're talking about increasing your fines and, you know, you're going to have 8 to 12 hours of community service and don't freak out. I'll get back to you. And then he goes radio silent for like the rest of the day. I'm freaking out. Freaking out. So he finally calls me back the next day, and I'm like, dude, what happened? Is everything okay? What happened? I'm freaking out. And he says, well, you know, the maximum fine for each one of these tickets is $500, and, you know, they kind of got you, and don't worry, I'm just kidding. If I could reach through the phone, I'd punch you right in your face. I took care of your tickets. Don't worry, I got you covered. He said, the cop didn't show up. So you get off. And I said, but, but I'm guilty. And he said, but the cop didn't show up. That's how this works. I like how this works. <laughs> so I said to him, good job, well done, I'm very proud of you, thank you for being my friend. And I thought for a minute, and I was like, wait a minute. I was guilty going into that courtroom, but I walked out not guilty. Why? Because I knew my friend. He was my advocate. He went to represent me, and he was going to go plead on my behalf. And he got me out of it. It's technicality, but he got me out of it. Not because he knew the judge. You guys are not my judge, by the way. Don't judge me for this. Just say. <laughs> but that's what that story is all about. Now, I want to tell you guys another truth. I made up that story. I made up that whole story. Why? Because it's a great illustration of what we're talking about. <laughs> it's a great illustration that shows that a God who could have easily declared us guilty declared us not guilty. And when we get to that courtroom, it's important to know that Jesus is our defense attorney. You guys are looking at me like you hate me right now. <laughs> that was a good story, come on. In the story, <laughs> in the story, I knew my friend, he was an attorney. And in our cases, Jesus is our attorney. He's also our friend. And see, when we get to that courtroom in heaven, Jesus is going to be our defense attorney. And we know him. We know him. And he's there for us. And just like in my story, there's a cop that doesn't show up. And when we get to that courtroom in heaven, because we know Jesus, whether that, the devil shows up or not, we get to be not guilty, guys. You know, Jesus is going to walk into the courtroom. And God's the judge. And he's like, I know the judge. I'm your defense attorney. The judge is my dad. Don't worry, I got this. And Jesus says that we're not guilty. He says we're free. He says we're innocent and we're just and we're righteous because we know Jesus and he's our savior. 
doesn't matter what I've done. I'm guilty and I know it. So are you. Hopefully you guys know it. But because we know Jesus, we're not guilty. We talked about this at Bible study, study the other night. How when Jesus becomes our Savior and God judges us, He's not looking at us anymore. He's looking at us through Jesus' lenses. When He looks at us, He's no longer seeing that hot mess of a sinful person. He's seeing His Son and He sees us through His Son. What do we call Him? Jesus glasses? Jesus colored glasses. So it doesn't matter your dirt. It doesn't matter what's under your cushion. You know Jesus. When he went up on that cross and he extended his his arms and the blood came out every which way, he shed his blood for you and he shed it for me. Because that was the price that needed to be paid and he was willing to do it and he paid that for us. 1 John 2 and 1 says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And because you know that man, that king, that God, you're free. You're free. You're just. You're righteous. Not because you deserve it, but because he's God and he's good. And he's a God that loves us. That's why. Maybe you feel like that woman. Isn't that a country song? I feel like a woman. No, I'm just saying. But maybe you feel like that woman. Maybe you feel like you're full of sin and you're ashamed and it's very apparent what that sin looked like in your life. I can see it. You can see it. Jesus sees it. But God says to you, you are my child. You're forgiven. You're not washed up. You're not used goods. You have a new life in me. Or maybe you're like the Pharisees who honestly look like they're really nice couches. Where their lives looked like they were really put together, but deep down in the crevices... Deep down, we know their hearts were off. Is your heart off tonight? And what God says to you is the same thing that he said to that woman. Your sin might be a little bit harder to detect. It might look a little different. But you are guilty. And his grace covers you. It's important to know who we know in God's courtroom. We know the defense attorney. The defense attorney knows the judge. We're not guilty. We're free. We're free. Go and sin no more. Just because you've been holding on to something for so long. Just because you're comfortable in your sin. Jesus says, go and sin no more. You are free from that tonight, church. Each and every one of you, that thing that has held on to you for so long. That thing that you say, I don't know how to get rid of this. It's not your job to get rid of it. Let Him do it. Because you are free, go and sin no more. As we continue to put Jesus' words into practice over this series, we're going to be with him. We talked about that last week. 
And when we be with Him, we're going to see and we're going to experience His forgiveness, true forgiveness. And as we experience His forgiveness, we can't help but want to share that with other people. Do you know how many times a week I get to tell people that I'm free? I was sitting at work this past week. For many of you that don't know, I'm a recovering alcoholic. Hi, my name is Chris and I'm an alcoholic. But I was sitting at work this week and it was hot this week. And what goes really good on a hot day? Ice cold beer. And all of these, the, the people that I work with were sitting around talking about how they couldn't wait to get out and sit on their deck and have that nice cold beer in the warm, hot sun. And they said, Chris, what about you? I said, no, I can't do that. I have Jesus. But I'm, I've been 20 years into recovery. I'm an alcoholic. I can't do that. And they went, no, you're not. No, you didn't. You can't pot. No, not you. No. And I said, yeah. Yeah, because the guy that I used to be was a much different person. I got set free. I got set free. I believe that it is time, look around you, look out there, it is time for forgiveness right now. We have, we've been forgiven. And we have to lead the charge in this nation to show people what forgiveness really is. People are against each other more now than they have ever been. If I say black, you say white. If I say jump, you say no. If I say the sky is blue, somebody's going to tell me it's orange just because they want to fight. Racial tensions are high. Everything is high. And sadly, people have figured out that they can make money escalating those situations. Social media has become a platform for hatred and division, just like mainstream media. It's really easy to put out a message you hate when nobody's there to punch you in the face. People have gotten really comfortable saying what they want without getting punched in the face. But it's time for forgiveness right now. Those people that may believe differently than we do, those people that rebel against the way that we stand, now is the time we share God's forgiveness. We get to share with them this is how I used to be, church. Guys, this is what I was like once. And then I got forgiven. And guess what? I'm a different person now. And I know you think you like the person that you are. But let me tell you, there's so much better for you. Super easy message. And you didn't offend anybody except for the woman that Pam talked to at the Chinese restaurant. <laughs> but at Victory Biker Church... We want to lead the charge with forgiveness because that's what God did for us. Somebody's got to lead that charge. Why not this crazy little biker church in the middle of the country? Why not us? Because if God did it for us, we need to share it with them so he can do it for them too. We want to be that family of faith-filled, big-thinking, huge-hearted followers of Christ. That's what we've been called to be. That's what I want for us. I hope that's what you want for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this message. Because boy, didn't I need it. Thank you for your forgiveness. And thank you for getting down in my dirt and cleaning it up. 
Thank you for flipping over my couch cushions and when you see that it needs to be done again, Lord, please flip those tables and cushions over again. But Lord, I ask that you give us, you, you continue to show us that forgiveness that, that we need to share. That as we go out into the world and we go out and we see the people that you put in our paths, that we can show them your forgiveness. Because there's going to be people that disagree with us. There's going to be people that rebel against us. But we're going to do exactly what you did. And we're going to tell them that you love, you love them anyway. And that we love them too. So Lord, as we worship tonight, open our hearts and open our spirits to your forgiveness. And Lord, if there is someone here that is struggling with that thing that they can't get rid of, they can't let go of, they can't put down and set aside on their own, let them know that you've got this, that you are our defense attorney and that you've already taken it away, that they are not guilty and they are free. Thank you for making us free, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Father, thank you for the gift of your son, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that he not only went to court for us, Lord, but he also paid the price for us. He took the punishment that we deserve so we can have the righteousness that we don't reserve. Lord, we thank you for him, and we ask that you would help us to take this message to the world around us, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I think Lincoln liked that one. <laughs>